Hey guys, what's going on? I am back. Today in episode two, we're going to start off by talking about how I would structure a portfolio if I was starting out, if I was a beginner in the stock market. And of course, I'm going to talk about how I have structured this portfolio for this series. Then we're going to jump into looking at the portfolio that I've got, the initial holdings that I've put into this portfolio for you guys. And then I'm going to go through and talk about each of them and give you reasons for why I've included each of the holdings. If you are enjoying the series, make sure you hit that like button. It helps me out a ton. Make sure you're subscribed and hit that notification bell so that you get notified each time I upload a new series. And if you're a real OG, make sure you're on my VIP list. It's linked in the description below. It's completely free and you get each of my videos 24 hours before they go public. Just before we jump into this episode, I do want to announce that I have started a podcast with Brandon from the Aussie Wealth Creation YouTube channel. This podcast will be posted over on his channel. I'll link his channel down below and it's just going to be half an hour to an hour every single Saturday where we just talk about the stock market news and break down some stocks and answer a lot of your questions. It's going to be really casual and we're going to try and keep it nice and light and sort of just just, just having a good chat about the stock market and not too serious, something that's really easy to listen to. The first episode is already out on his channel and if you don't want to watch it on YouTube because I know that's kind of annoying watching a podcast on YouTube, you can also watch it on iTunes and on Spotify. So just search for the Young Investors Podcast and it should come up for you. I'm actually not sure if it's on iTunes yet, but I have checked Spotify and it is on Spotify. So um, you can go over there and follow that and make sure that you get updated whenever a new podcast comes out. But besides that, make sure you're subscribed to the Aussie Wealth Creation YouTube channel, as I'm sure most of you are, because a lot of you have come over from there, especially since we've posted that video. So welcome to all the new people who have come across to my channel, and I hope you enjoy this episode. All right, so let's start off by talking about how I would structure a portfolio. Now, there's a couple of things that you want to avoid when you're just getting into the stock market. And I touched on these at the end of last episode, but in case you didn't see that, I want to expand on those right now. So the first is that you invest in some individual stocks and that's all you do. You pick one or two individual stocks and they're not the greatest picks and they perform really poorly because maybe you're not a great investor when you start out. Don't worry, we've all been there. Um, and a lot of beginners get into the trap where they invest in a couple of stocks, they do really poorly and they just take their money out and they never invest again. So we certainly don't want you to do that. And the other mistake that people make is that they get bored of their portfolio and that they get bored of the returns not really showing because it's really a long-term game um, and you're not going to see you know, 50, 100% returns within a week. And a lot of people get bored, a lot of beginners get bored and they start to make really high-risk investments, taking on way too much risk. And eventually, these high-risk investments fail over the long term. No one has sustainably invested successfully in really high risk investments. So eventually these crumble and again, you're going to be put off from investing in the market. So we want to avoid those two things. And I have a couple of ways that I structure my portfolio to avoid making those mistakes as a beginner. All right. So to tackle the first problem, I would recommend that you invest 50 to 100% of your initial stake into an index fund. Now, if you don't know what an index fund is, it's a fund that you can, well, basically it's a stock on the stock exchange and it comes under the heading of an ETF. It's an exchange traded fund. And what index means is that it tracks a particular set of stocks that are within the market. It's not an actively um, actively managed fund. It's not like there's someone there making decisions for the fund. It's just tracking a certain index. And I'll give you an example. There's one on the, U on the uh, New York Stock Exchange, which is called SPY or SPY. And essentially, it gives you a piece of every single business in the top 500 companies on the New York Stock Exchange. So it will give you a piece of all of the biggest companies that you know, Apple, Coca-Cola, Facebook, it'll give you all of those really big companies. And basically, this is great because it gives you a, div a, di a diversified base um, for your portfolio. So you're going to have a little bit invested broadly across the US market. And you can also do this in the Australian market. One that I use personally is VAS, which is the Vanguard Australian Shares Index. And that one gives you a piece of the top 300 companies on the Australian Stock Exchange. And this is a really good thing to do because it means that a lot of your money is diversified in a market. And over the long term, the US and the Australian markets have returned about 8 to 12% per year over the very long term. And I think the Australian market has actually performed a little bit better than the US market over the very long term. 
Um, but certainly in the last 20 years, the US market has outperformed the Australian market. But that is why you want that as your base of your portfolio so that even if you make a couple of bad picks over the long term, 50 to 75 to 100% of your portfolio, depending on how much you want to invest in individual stocks, will perform at 8 to 10% per year, which is a really, really solid return. So next we need to tackle the problem of getting bored about our portfolio. Now, for some people this won't apply. Some people will happily just invest 100% of their money in a couple of index funds. Maybe they have 75% in the US market and 25% in the Australian market and they're happy to just invest every three, six or 12 months and just add to that slowly and they're happy to get their eight to 10% returns. But for those who are gonna get bored by this and those who are actually interested in learning about individual stocks, you want to have about 25% to 50% of your money in individual stocks that you have analyzed using a sound strategy. Not only does this ensure that you're not going to get bored, it'll actually boost your returns over the long term if you are good at implementing that strategy because the kind of returns that I look for on individual stocks is somewhere between 15% to 20% per year. So it's gonna drastically increase the return that you're gonna get as long as you're able to accurately implement that strategy. And don't worry if you don't have a strategy or you have a strategy but it's not really working out for you because throughout this series, I'm gonna go through each and every aspect of how you can use the strategy that I use and the strategy that I've had success with picking individual businesses. So just to summarize, if I was starting a brand new portfolio as a beginner, I would start by putting 50 to 75% of my money in an index fund such as SPY, which tracks the US market or VAS, which tracks the Australian market. And then I would use the rest of my money and also money that I'm accumulating over the time period it takes me to find these individual stocks. And I would find individual stocks, analyze them and make sure I'm buying them at the right price and add those to the portfolio. And we want two to five of these stocks so that we're not just putting 50% of our portfolio in one stock. We wanna make sure that we never have more than 20% of our portfolio in an individual stock at a time. So now that we've got that out of the way, let's have a look at my portfolio right now. Now, to start off, I've kept it really simple. I've just got an index fund and two individual stocks, and that's because I want to make this series as applicable to beginners as possible. You can see what it's like from starting from absolute scratch all the way up to building a portfolio over the next few months and years. So for this series, I'm using the trading platform Stake to keep track of my holdings. And as you can see, I've invested in three stocks. The first is Facebook stock, which is obviously an individual business and you've probably heard of it. The second one is the S&P 500 and that is that SPY index fund that I just spoke about. And the last one is Thor Industries. So as you can see, I've structured my portfolio with just over 50% of my money in the broad US market to ensure we have that nice diversified base. And then I've taken the other 50% of our money and invested it in two individual businesses, that being Facebook and Thor Industries. Now I just wanna spend the rest of this video talking about why I've picked those two individual stocks to give you a bit of context as to why I've started out with those two. And essentially the reason is basically they fit most, if not all of my criteria. And my criteria comes down to two components. And if you listen to the podcast, I explain this really in depth at the end of that podcast in the last maybe 10 or 20 minutes I explain this, um, but I'll go over brief briefly. The first part is that you need to buy really great businesses that are going to be great and stay successfully competitive in that marketplace for at least 10 years. And the second part is that we need to buy it at 50% of fair value. So of course that means that we need to calculate what the fair value is, then we discount that by 50% and we would only buy into the stock if we think that it is at half price essentially. Half of the price, the price, <laughs> the price, I'm just gonna keep that in. Half the price of the fair value. How much we calculate that it's worth, discount it by 50% and that's how much we're willing to pay. All right, so let's go through and see how Facebook and Thor Industries fit our criteria. Okay, so let's start off with Thor Industries. And of course, first we need to work out, is it a great business that's gonna remain competitive over the next 10 years? And I have three criteria that I use to work that out. The first is meaning. It has to have some sort of personal meaning to you so that you're interested enough to learn about it um, consistently week after week and it also has to be within your circle of competence a business model that you can easily understand Thor is a very easy business to understand for those who don't know it's an RV manufacturer or a caravan manufacturer for those in Australia and essentially 
There's these dealerships, which are the retail sellers of caravans, and every time they sell one to a customer, they order another one from manufacturers such as Thought Industries. And it means it's really easy to calculate where the business is going because we just have a look at the retail RV sales for the industry, which have been growing at about 10 to 12% per year. And we can work out that that is how many RVs these dealerships are going to order from companies like Thor Industries. The next criteria is moat. It has to have some sort of long-term competitive advantage that ensures it's gonna stay the leader in the industry or at least stay very, very competitive over the next 10 years. For Thor, this moat comes in the form of having over 50% market share in the RV industry, which is insane. So that means for every two RVs that are sold in the United States, one of them is likely to be a Thor Industries caravan. Thor has also demonstrated that it has a strong economic moat by growing its margins over time. If we see that the net margin and the gross margin are shrinking, it can indicate that they're having to ramp up their costs, maybe it's advertising or more staff, in order to stay competitive and fend off competition. But their margins have actually been growing, so they've been getting better and better at producing net income from that revenue. And we also like to look at those four key growth numbers to ensure that they're growing over time. And for Thor, they have been growing very, very consistently over 10 to 20 years. And those four areas we look at are sales or revenue, earnings per share, equity, and free cash flow. And the last criteria we need to look at is does the management have skill and integrity? And there's a couple of things I like to look at in order to see this. The first is what is the ROIC, which is the return on invested capital. Essentially, it tells us of the money that they're using to invest in inside the business, what is the return that they're producing? And for Thor Industries, it's been amazing. It's been 15 plus percent over five years, and it's been 25% this year. The management has also been able to operate with very, very little debt, which is very good because it means there's very little risk to us. A couple of other things is that the co-founder is still the chairman of the board, which means that one of the people who founded the company, who had the vision for the company, is still within the company. They've never had an unprofitable year since they IPO'd in 1984. And speaking of 1984, that is another thing. They've been around for 30 years. And as you saw in the growth numbers earlier, they've been able to perform exceptionally over that time. And the last thing that I like to look at is to see if the letters to the shareholders are transparent. A lot of management will write these letters to the shareholders and they'll be really salesy, like they're trying to acquire more shareholders and just push the stock price up. That is not the case with Thor Industries. They're always very honest about what problems they're having and that is a really great sign and it means that our management has skill and integrity. So then the second component of my strategy is that we need to make sure we're buying it at 50% of fair value. First, I calculated what price I think Thor will be at in 10 years time by growing the earnings for 10 years at their long-term EPS growth rate to get an earnings of $35.57 in 2027. Then I multiplied that by their average PE ratio of 16 to get a price in 2027 of $570 per share. I then added the total dividends over that 10 year period, assuming a 17% payout ratio. So the amount we can expect to get back over 10 years is $600 per share. I then discounted the price back to reach the fair value of about $180 per share. But remember, we only want to pay 50% of fair value, so we would want to buy it at around $90 per share, which is just about the current stock price. To summarize, while I think Thor can do about 18% growth per year, if they do just 10%, we will 4x our money over 10 years, a return of 15% per year. Also, by the way, if you want to use this spreadsheet in your own valuation, there's a link to it in the description below so that you can apply it in your own analysis. So then we have Facebook stock and I took a very similar approach with Facebook stock. First, we needed to work out if it's a really great business. It's well within my circle of competence and has personal meaning to me and that's because I've done quite a bit of work with Facebook ads and digital marketing, so I really understand how their business operates. In terms of an economic moat, I think that they have probably the strongest networking effect moat in all of history. They have, what, 1.5 billion daily active users and over 2 billion monthly active users, which is an insanely big moat. And it means that all of those people using Facebook and using Facebook's platforms such as Instagram and WhatsApp 
it's going to be very difficult for someone to come in and compete with them and move all of those people from Facebook onto another platform. And this moat is again supported by the growth of those four key areas over the past eight years, which has been really strong. Its management has been led by its founder, Mark Zuckerberg, and they've also maintained a super high ROIC while also maintaining very little debt on their balance sheet. Using a 30% growth rate over a five year period and assuming no dividends, we get a fair value of $360 per share. That makes Facebook a buy at $180 per share. To summarize, while I think that Facebook can do 30% growth over the next five years, they only need to do about 13.5% for us to make our 15% per year. That's all I've got for you guys for today. In next week's episode, we're gonna start going through and looking for individual companies to add to our portfolio. Now, if that last bit of the video where I went through the valuation and went through my strategy really quickly, if it made no sense, don't worry. In this series, I'm gonna go through slowly each and every aspect and take you through the process and hopefully we'll find some businesses that we can use our strategy all the way through and find really great businesses using this strategy so that you can then go and apply that in your own valuation. That's all from me for today. I hope you guys have a great day and I'll see you in the next one.